Now, coming up, a man who from 1963 on has literally grown up in front of our eyes and ears, Fred Lantrimo. But first, meet our very own international superstar, Judith Forst. Mezzo-soprano Judith Forst's professional singing career started early. She was barely in her 20s when she auditioned for the Metropolitan Opera's Rudolf Bing. He was so impressed by her voice that he hired her before the audition was over. Since then, she's worked at the Met and traveled to opera houses all over the world to sing. And she's sung with the best, Joan Sutherland and Canada's Maureen Forrester among them. But living in New York didn't hold much appeal for Judith after the children were born, so she, Graham, and the kids headed straight back to home territory, the suburbs of Port Moody. Not so far away from where it all began, with good basic training at UBC's music department. Neither of my parents sang. I think my grandparents, if the music came from anywhere, it was from my, my dad's mom and dad, uh, who played organ and directed choir at the church. And um, we, you know, we sang at home all the time, lots of sing songs on every birthday or Christmas, a lot of singing. And uh, when I had to, when I finished grade 12, and I was coming to university, and, and, but I wasn't sure to what. And so my mother said, well, I think you should take an aptitude test. So she brought me out and I did the test and I went to have it read and the counselor said, well, what are you interested in? And I said, well, I do a lot of music. He says, well, you should go into the music department. So I came out with that bit of news for my mother and she threw her hands up and said, oh, for heaven's sake, go ahead. <laughs> she thought I should try something else. Is it true that you played the role of Virgin Mary in an opera when you were pregnant? Do you remember that? <laughs> yes, that was in New York, a Berlioz piece, L'Enfance du Christ. And I was expecting Paula. And uh, it was around Christmas time. <laughs> there I was. I had a lovely blue velvet gown, though. <laughs> so, but they, oh, sure. I mean, I remember when I was expecting Noel doing uh, Lola and Cavalleria it, at the Met, and the, the set had, it was a Zeffirelli set, and the stairs went from the, f the stage right up to the opening of the church, and they were huge. This, it was really a set of stairs. And uh, I had to climb up in this huge gown. My mother was in the audience, and coming down, I think she almost had a heart attack because she kept thinking I was going to fall. I knew I wasn't. I mean, I knew exactly what I was doing, but I did Hansel and Gretel at the mat, met when I was pregnant. <laughs> so there, there I was in later Hosen, but uh, oh no, sure, we do all these things. <laughs> Terrified. Petrified. Still? Yeah. More than in the olden days? No, the no. Early, I, early days? No, no. I'm, um, I'm not fussy about how nervous I get. I just, I do. I'm a nervous performer. And some people, I think we all are, if we, the truth be known. Oh, of course. I really am. I do, I do think that. I think some more so than others. I think some people are more comfortable in front of 4,000 people than others. But um, it's hard. You know, I, I do everything I can to prepare. And I still get very nervous. And I know I know it. I know I can sing it, all the rest. But there's just something about there's no turning back. When that curtain goes up, you can't, you can't fix it. And what comes out, and you never know what's going to come out of your mouth. You and you're pretty sure, but you never know. Sometimes you'll get a little glitch in there. And you know, you're just as surprised as those listening, because you, you didn't know what was there. <laughs> think that maybe you didn't suffer enough, that it all came too easily for you? <laughs> Have you paid your I dues I suffered. <laughs> I said, when I think about all I had to learn in the, the first season, I, mean, I just was non-stop. And we had one day off a week, and you felt you should still be studying. I mean, it was just constant work. Really. It still is, though, you see. I mean, no, once in a while, I'll go back. Next season, I have one, two, three operas that I've done before. The rest is all new. It's terrible. And one that I've done before, but we're changing the language. We're going from, I, last time I did it was in German, and this time we're going to do it in English, so I have to learn a new text. I mean, it's just not ending. Always, always. Preparation and, and study and coaching, going to New York for, for polishing. So it just never stops. Never stops. Fred Lattermo has been in radio for 26 years now. He's currently the morning man at Sea Fun. He's also a West Coaster through and through. 
Many years ago, he had a chance to leave. He was driving east to the big time in Montreal, and after thinking about it, all the way to Medicine Hat, he turned around and has never left the coast. His Vancouver career started at CJOR in 1963. His television career started with Let's Go at the CBC with mentor Red Robinson. He's been a TV newscaster, a talk show host, a Georgia Strait editor, and a drummer. But no matter what he's been, he's always been Fred Latrimo. As I look back, I think that I was so, so busy that I may have missed uh, some of the fun of, of being a teenager. Busy doing what? Oh, just, you know, I was working at 16. I was in Peace River at, uh, at 16. I was playing drums at, at 14 through 16, which I enjoyed. Uh, but once I started working in radio, uh, I think that uh, many of my friends went on to college and all that kind of thing, and, and they could stay being kids. And I was, you know, having to deal with growing up in a, in, a, in a more public forum. When I sat in my room and listened to Red Robinson years ago and heard that kind of magic and the music mm -hmm. and the excitement, uh, I related to it and, and wanted to be part of it, and I felt like that it, it encompassed me. Uh, my uh, stepfather then was director of CBC Radio for wow. Vancouver, Bob Harlow. Yeah. And uh, so I would go down and watch announcers do their thing. I just thought it was magic. I, I couldn't understand and still actually don't how the hell that, those words get out of the microphone and into the... <laughs> what happened to the drumming? Uh, it never was very good and stayed that way. <laughs> <laughs> but you did do one record. Yeah, that was just a fluke. Uh, we, we were playing with a band that later became uh, Chilliwack, and uh, I guess they were the collectors before that, but, and they were the Seafun Classics before that, and that's how I was with them. Let's go. Was that your first plunge into television? Yeah, it was a real charge to see myself on television and all that and to get the recognition that comes with that. And we really did quite well across the country with that show, for what it was. But I remember at the end that the show would be taped and everybody going to watch it afterwards, and I'd just go home. <laughs> I didn't want to see it. I just didn't feel like it was something I was into you know, anymore. You had a brush with cancer that I'm sure altered your life. Yeah, you don't have a brush with cancer. Some, some people have a... Yeah, I suppose some people do. I had a go with it. Uh, and uh, that was uh, one of those experiences I look back on now again and realize that I learned a great deal. But at the time, it was frightening. Uh, and anybody who's gone through that can tell you it's very, very scary to suddenly find yourself uh, when you've relied on yourself in almost all circumstances powerless. Yeah. And I think that maybe it's one of those things that's good for us because, you know, the bottom line is we all are, you know. And so we have to... Uh, I guess make some sense out of that, and it, it, it humbles one. Would you say that the, the uh, kokanee spots that you have been doing for low these many years are uh, some of the best things you've ever done? Don't worry, we'll see yeah. Mountain Brew for it. Uh, yeah. I love the Chevron spots that won all the awards that we did, but uh, the kokanee have been consistently strong for a long, long time. Uh, they're, they're just a lot of fun. They don't sit around and say how wonderful beer is. They just, they're zany, and I, I, I like that about them. You know, they're just... Uh, they, just, I, to, they tickle me, anyway. You see the funny things in life. You, you look at a scene that everybody else would walk by and you say, that's funny. Yeah, I think so. I really have come to the conclusion, uh, or I'm coming to the conclusion, that there's a hell of a lot of illusion out there that I took really seriously for a long time. And now I'm, I'm enjoying uh, the understanding that, you know, there's no, real, uh, there's no real big serious number going on here. I can, I can actually settle back and, and uh, chuckle a little. You, know. you always seem restless, always on the move, looking for something. Is it fair to say that you've always then been challenging yourself? Yeah, I, th I think, uh, you know, I was watching one of these old documentaries, The Trouble with Fred, or whatever it was called, that was done back then. And at one point, they asked me, I'm looking very wide-eyed in the camera, and I look like I just don't want to answer any more questions. And the guy says, uh, well, what are you most afraid of? And I said, standing still. Well, I'm not afraid of that anymore. I like standing still. Yes, good. Silence is pretty good, too. Real good. <laughs> Fred was named 1987's Announcer of the Year by the broadcasters of British Columbia. Of course, he continues mornings at Seafun. While Judith balances a home and family life with performances around the world, not easy.